Okay, hopefully this is a better uh, place for you, especially the beginning of the semester. I'm going to be doing pen and paper along with you, so using whiteboards will work. I, I did have a system in the other room where I would project on it a nice grid, so that will be interesting to see how that works in, in future classes. Um, but um, for, for a while at least, I'll actually not be using the projectors, um, so feel free to, to sit wherever you are in the class. Hopefully there's more room for you. There's two seats up here that you can use. There's another seat up there, so uh, you definitely probably want to have a spot where you can write uh, on a, a table. Um, books, I see a few of you have brought books already. Good. Um, hopefully you've purchased them and they're on route if they haven't already arrived. So uh, we will definitely, in class, be using your books. So be prepared to bring your books to class uh, because there will be a lot of times when I say, let's work through problem 47 in your textbook or whatever that might be. So just get in the habit of bringing your textbooks to, to class. I know today, uh, as, as you're working through things, that uh, probably is not um, going to be as much. So I will use the document cam. Um, in order to to project a shared uh, textbook space here today. But in general, uh, I will not be doing that because I'll want to be using the projector for other things. Um, let's see. You should have all received uh, your uh, listing of who your your well, you should have most of you told me who your partner was. There was there turns out to be an odd number I can't count. Uh, so there's one group of three. Um, so um, uh, you, who your partner is and what uh, state you'll be using. Uh, as I said in the, the message, if you gave me five states to choose from, I was able to pick from your top three. Uh, but a lot of, well, more than I expected, gave me states with less than four representatives. Um, less than five representatives, I should say. <laughs> Um, and so you guys kind of got the shaft when it came to, uh, you didn't follow the instructions, you get last pick is kind of how it went. All right. Uh, so uh, your Friday uh, final project assignment is to identify within the state that you've been assigned f at least 50 different um, geographical regions that in total cover the entire state okay and there can't be overlapping uh, regions so an example in Indiana would be the counties okay there are more than 50 counties in the state all the, the counties uh, will cover the state there's not any missing parts and the region the reason for this is that what you're going to need to do later on is be able to uh, figure out how many people are in each one of these regions. Okay, you, uh, that, that will come from maybe the <coughs> census data or something like that. Uh, because when we're trying to figure out which regions to assign each representative, we need to know how many people fit in that region. Now what we're not doing is we are not going down to the census block or the census tract level like a, an official uh, apportionment would do. So if you, in, in, in 2020, after they do the census and they reapportion all the states, they do that based on, on census information. And that's, that's very um, small units and it's, it's, it's more accurate and it would be great to do, but it, it would become very tedious for, for you to work on, on this project. And so I'm letting you do at a, a larger granularity, okay? However, there are some states that don't have a, um, natural borders like counties, or not enough of them. You know, I think one set of students last year, they, their state had three counties in the entire state. Uh, so that, uh, that really defeats the purpose uh, and they had five representatives in, in, that, in that state, so, okay. <coughs> so it just depends upon 
Um, you know, the size of the state it depends, depends upon the population of the state. Um, you need to identify what those regions are going to be for your state. There are some states that don't have 50 counties, and so you're going to have to do some sort of subdivision. Okay? Uh, and the reason for this is if, if we get too small, there's just not enough to partition between all the different representatives that you're, you're trying to assign people to. So that's why 50 is the, the minimum. You can go any amount larger than that that you wish. Okay? Um, so hopefully you sh and your partner should be able to figure that out and should, should be able to identify that. Uh, you probably want to start building up some sort of a, a spreadsheet. If you're going to do this collaborative, maybe Google uh, Docs might uh, do that for you. Unfortunately, I'll just let you know ahead of time, the primary tool that we will use in this class does not work on Google Docs. Okay, so you won't be able to live in Google Docs for the entire of the sem uh, semester. You, you might be able to use that as initial data gathering, but you'll have to export that to an Excel spreadsheet uh, when, when the computation part of the, the class takes place. Um, and you'll, you'll want to do that because future, I want you to be thinking future, future uh, parts of the project will require you to do things like actually collect the population for each one of these regions that you're identifying. You'll have to also collect election information for these regions. So you may decide that, well, counties is great. I'm not going to be able to find election information on counties. I'm going to choose a different distribution uh, of, the, of that information because it will be easier for me to collect that information. Uh, a third thing that you will need is uh, location information. Where is that region located uh, in that state? Um, and it would be best if you can at least put a four corner bounding box around, the, uh, around that region so you can make rectangles around it. A single point is, is uh, not, it, makes, it will make your life more difficult later on because the, the region is not a single point, right? It, it actually takes physical space and so having something to approximate that physical space will be useful to you. So as you're deciding on the, these <coughs> regions of space here for, for this next assignment, make sure that you're kind of looking forward and trying to think about how easy will it be to, for me to be able to collect those other pieces of information, how, uh, population, uh, location information, voting, data that does that. Um, and uh, that is, is quite um, varied from state to state. One of the um, downsides to, to not having uh, federally run elections is that each um, <laughs> incorporation decides how it's going to run elections independently from any other uh, election area. So some states gather that all up really nice and neat and they put these in electronic documents that you can download and you can convert to all these different formats and it's wonderful and some other states say oh well as long as you tell us the total that's all we care about and we'll report that to the the press like that but uh, electronic information what is that um, and you'll have to contact each individual municipality uh, se separately, or each individual um, county separately to, to get that information. Usually via the web, so I'm not talking about actually physically, you know, that would be terrible, right? <laughs> talking to real people. <laughs> uh, but uh, <coughs> but you, you may have to actually contact 50 or more different organizations to get the data that you're interested in for this, um, this task. Um, and on top of that, if, if that's not worse uh, enough, each county might organize their data differently. Uh, and so you're going to have to somehow collect it and then 
unify it so it's the same across all those, those different reporting agencies. Um, and so one, one of the unintended or the less important byproducts that you learn from this experiment is that data collection is a, is a non-trivial process. So I would not wait until that data collection is due to start working on this project. Okay? I'm intentionally giving you a long time to collect information, especially election information, because for some of you it should, uh, should is the wrong word, it unfortunately might take you that long to collect that data. For others of you, it can be a really quick process, but I can't tell you, looking at your state, which one it is. So, start being proactive. Start collecting that information now, even before it's due. Okay? That is just something that you're going to want to do. Otherwise, you are not going to have enough time in an overnighter to complete that, uh, that particular thing. Um, and so you don't want to, to wait till the last minute. So are you just looking for a, like a list of the regions on Friday? Or for, yeah, so on Friday I want you to tell me what those, those okay. 50 plus regions are. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes? With the groups, do we both have to submit something? Or no, so from this point on, I have put you in a group, and a submission by one of you is a submission by both of you. Yes? Where can we see what state we have? Uh, um, so the, what <laughs> I uh, posted on the announcements yeah. should in okay. include the state, but also your group name includes your state. So it should be final project XX, whatever the postal co code is, for your particular state. Would, like going a lot over 50, would that make this project um, only if you're going to have to contact a lot over 50 regions. So if it turns out that your state um, does a good job of collating that information for you, going from, from 50 to even maybe 150 or 200 would not be that much more complex. Uh, but if the state does, going from, uh, it's, it would be all in the data collection where the complexity uh, rises. It's not in the the modeling or the computation side that it's a lot more complex. Right. Yeah. Is there a project schedule on Google somewhere? Uh, not yet. It's yes, but it's hidden. Um, so I'm I'm working on updating dates from from last year and making sure that it it's clear. So it will probably show up uh, within the next week. Um, but remember, there is going to be a project deliverable every single Friday. Okay. Yes? Would state voting, like state voting districts be a good um, No. No. So you're talking about the existing like, representative? Like, like, no, like state, rep, like state house representatives. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because that's got to that's cover the entire state, and they probably have already done a, a good job of somewhat evenly distributing them. Yeah. And so that, that could be a, a way to do it for sure. Yes? What kind of voter information are you looking for for this project? So what you'll end up having to, to capture are um, all the federal elections since I think 2010 um, for, for representatives and 2006 or 8 for, for Senate. And uh, so you'll want to capture all the U.S. representative elections all the Senate elections and all the presidential elections. Um, and you'll want to count for that particular area how many people voted Democratic, how many people voted Republican, and for the purposes of this assignment we'll let you ignore third party candidates. Any other questions? Yes? Um, I'm wondering what the advantage is to um, knowing that we have to divide our state into 50 locations after we pick our state. Like, are there just not enough states for us to quick do a search? Oh, is this, does this state have readily available information or not? Rather, I don't know, that just seems like a good requirement to have before we pick our state. The, they all do have 50 regions, but some of them might be cut. 
when I originally set up this assignment last year, I wanted to say counties. And then when I started looking at states, I discovered that that was a, a bad um, way to split it up for, for some states. Um, but there are, there is always a good solution for every state. All right. So uh, let's uh, let's then transition from the final project then to um, talking about how we're going to go about solving problems in this class. All right. So I'm going to, especially early on, I'm going to hammer these steps uh, re really thoroughly so that we just get into the habit of going through these steps in this particular order. And, um, and then eventually it will just hopefully feel natural and this just how we'll we'll do it even though we won't say this is step two, this is step three, and, and so forth. Um, and so uh, when, when we're looking at our <coughs> when we're looking at our models, what we're going to want to start off with is we want to do what, what's called define our decision variable. Okay, in other words, what, what is the answer or the answers, because we might use our model to ask multiple questions, that we're trying to look for. So if we're trying to maximize profit, we want to say that our variable is going to relate to profit. If we're trying to minimize cost, our variable has to relate to cost. So we want to start with identifying specifically what we're trying to look at. What is, the, what is that variable? And then this sounds like it's, it's tied to what I just said, but we want to describe our objective. So if profit is our variable, our objective is going to be maximize profit. Okay, and so I'm differentiating the, the variable that we're trying to compute with what we're trying to do with that computed value. Okay, um, and so, so this is our goal. In addition to the objective variable, our decision variable should also include um, anything that we're using to measure. So um, our costs might be material costs, and our costs might be um, labor costs. Our costs might be um, transportation, uh, fuel. It, it might be uh, that we have to pay taxes. So we, we need to make sure that we incorporate all of those, those different costs into our variable, and we also need to know what it is changing, right? So it might be a distance. It might be a number of units of that product that we're selling. It might be a number of employees that, that we're hiring. It might be a number of hours that we're working on, on this project. So we need to understand each of those different things, and those all go in these variables, and then which one of those are we trying to um, focus on f for our goal. Um, the third thing then is that we need to describe each constraint in terms of our variables. Okay. Um, so, for instance, uh, if we're talking about labor costs, one constraint may be that we don't want to pay overtime. So the amount of time that our employee works has to be less than or equal to, to 40. That's a constraint that's limiting the value of, of a variable, that being how many hours that employer works, um, because of a, a choice that we made. Uh, maybe 
we have a constraint that we're shipping some unit from point A to point B, and we know that our semi-tractor trailers have a, a maximum distance before they, they run out of gas. And so that's going to give a range. We can't go beyond that range. We can only ship with, within this distance. And so that's going to be constraint that uh, limits, again, how far we're willing to transport the, those goods from our warehouse to a, a particular retail establishment or whatever. And so we need to make sure that we put these, these constraints um, in terms of those variables. And then also, we're going to describe our objective. So maybe I shouldn't say describe because I did that earlier. Let's put, let's say, put our objective in terms of our variables. So if we're trying to maximize profit, we need to say, well, these are the variables that affect our profit. So our profit equals our um, cost of sale minus cost of purchase, you know, to simplify it or whatever the case may be. So we have our variables up here, and all of our equations in part three and four need to be written in terms of those variables. If there's something that we need either to descri uh, describe a constraint or to describe our objective, and it's not up here, that means we've missed something in, in the first part of our, our problem statement. So we need to make sure that everything is in terms of that. And then these, these for, for this class, must be linear equations. Remember what we talked about on Friday, we had some rules of thumb that you knew whether or not an equation was linear or not based on the exponent couldn't be larger than one, you couldn't multiply two variables together, you couldn't use any nonlinear functions, and so forth. You need to make sure that your equations follow those limitations that we're placing on here for, for our solution. So this is the process that we're going to go. We're going to start through uh, each one of these, and we're going to make a model then that we can solve using our equations here. All right? So let's go ahead and go through a problem. So if you have your book, uh, that's great. We're going to do problem 230. If you don't, I'm about to... Turn on the document cam here. about that. The new document cam is a USB webcam, which means you have to use this computer to display the document cam. And I have no idea what my campus username and passwords are. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, um, huh? 
You, one of you may log in if you wish. That would be very helpful to me. Who wants to be? Oh, no. No, it's a campus community. Thank you. All right. <laughs> okay. While we're waiting for that to come up, and that might take a while here, um, let me let me uh, main desktop. Let me read the problem to you here. All right, problem two thirty in this book. If you have it, it's page seventy four. All right. Hover cam flex 11, does that sound like the right thing? <laughs> oh, that looks right to me. There we go. <laughs> Let's rotate here. I did that. Yeah. And uh, we can zoom in here. There we go. Technology, isn't it great? Okay. So what I'd like you to do, let's see if I can do something heavy enough to keep that there, is uh, in your groups uh, of four or a little bit more, I would like you to see if you can do um, at least steps one and two. What are the decision variables and what is the objective? Okay, so read through, read through the problem. Step one, we're trying to make some decisions. 
What are we trying to make a decision about? How many shares of what to buy? Of each stock. So how many decisions are we making? Two. Two. Okay. So let's uh, let's call these. Um, uh, so what's the name of the first company? Okay. So let's we can call that E. Is and this is important. This number of Eastern with the cable shares. Now it's important that we're specific here, that we're not saying this is a dollar amount. Because a dollar amount is different than the number of shares, right? Each share costs uh, $40, and we're going to sell it for 55 later, right? So this is number of shares, not cost of, of the shares. What's the second <laughs> one? Comp switch. Okay, so we can do C. And again, we're going to do the same thing, number of comp switch. Okay, those are the decisions that we're trying to make. How many of those? And what's going to inform that decision then, part two, is what, what is our goal? What are we trying to do? Okay, so we want to maximize our return or our profit on, on these. Okay? We haven't talked about mathematically how to do that, but that's what our, our goal is, right? And we'll get to in here an equation that represents that, right? So part three, what are the constraints? Someone from that back table there, give me a constraint that, that limits what we can choose, yeah? Um, the recommended amount to invest for com switch. Okay, Wait, is how much? At most 25,000. So at most 25,000, so how is that, how are we gonna put that in terms of an equation, in terms of E and or C. How much do we spend on, on C, on one share of C? 25. 25? Okay, so if we multiply 25 times the number of shares that we buy, that's how much we spend, right? Okay, and what do we need to make sure is true? That's less than or equal to 25,000, okay? Back in that corner, give me another constraint. Uh, total investment is a maximum of 50,000. Okay. So that would that be 25C times the 40E is less than or equal to? Time, 25C times the 40E plus, 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 plus the 40E. Plus the 40E. And you know what? I'm already going to redo this. Oh, oh, oh Just <laughs> so it'll be easier to see. So 25C plus 40E is less than or equal to That way, it's a lot easier to, s to keep one variable aligned through all your different constraints. Okay? Um, up front here, what's a third constraint? 40E is greater than 15,000. Okay. Um, over here, side table. Give me another constraint. Okay, so how do we? So that'd be 25C greater than or equal to 10,000. Okay, front tables here. Give me another constraint. Someone help them out. No, that's not a constraint. Uh, 
I see a lot of puzzled looks here. Uh, yes? Can we make a constraint off the, the takeover share prices? Uh, no, because that's going to be for our profit, right? Is it that your spend money has to be greater than or equal to zero dollars? Okay, close. Um, <coughs> no, we, we, we've got, um, it, you're, you're close. We want a logical constraint like that. Um, and we will oftentimes have logical constraints, and that is that we don't buy a non-negative number of shares. Okay, <laughs> because you uh, so no shorting stock in this scenario. But in general, in general. Your problems are not going to have something that specifies something like this. But, like I said, this is a logical constraint. And our solution strategy depends upon us having non-negative uh, values of our variables. We can't drive negative distance. We can't work negative amount of hours. Um, and if you don't write that in there, there could be a mathematical solution that does say work a negative amount of hours because that will save us money, right? <laughs> okay, so you have to be explicit about that in the, the mathematical model. Yes? But the only equation that we have is that implied by 40 years? It, it is implied in here, but I want to be explicit about it to make sure that you're watching for that constraint. And sometimes, this non-negativity might be implied, but it might not be noticeable because the slope is not horizontal or vertical in those cases. It might not just be this constraint um, and this constraint here. Okay. So in this special case it is, but I want you to always be looking for what are those logical constraints there. Okay. So we have, we've defined our decision variables, described our objective, now we have our constraint formulation. Let's return to our objective and turn it into an equation. Okay? So what, what is the, the profit, the return that we make? Um, so if we buy C Comstock shares and we buy E Eastern uh, switch or Eastern cable um, shares, how much do we, how much do we make? Okay, so let's, uh, and we'll, we'll just call this P for profit, and we're going to say, what, what's the difference for, since I've got C first here, what's the difference in, um, in uh, com switch shares? $15. because we sell it for $40, but we buy it for $25. So our profit is going to be $15 for every, sh every share. Oh, I'm sorry. So we buy Tom Switch for 25 and we sell it for 43, so that's actually 18. Thank you. And what is our profit from the, the Eastern Cable? We buy that for 40 and we sell it for 45. So, 15. All right. So normally we, we will say something like maximize this equation subject to these constraints right here. This is this looks very familiar to most of the problems you're going to see for the rest of the semester. What's going to change are the number of variables and um, how we build these constraints. So how do we turn something into a linear model? We're going to be operating in this kind of problem space the entire semester long. Okay? It's all about can we turn something like we see on the, the screens, text, into this kind of a problem. If we can, 
we will have that. It, it's like we're going to have a hammer and we're going to turn everything into a nail. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, the nice thing is I'm giving you problems that will be be good fits for turn, being turned into nails. Okay. <laughs> okay. So how do we solve this? Okay. I want to keep this up here. So um, excuse me for those of you who go behind. Uh, who I go behind, I'm going to switch over to here. For now, we're going to focus on graphing the feasible region. Okay. So um, right now, what we're going to do is we're just going to examine the graph. And, and use the graph to determine what the solution is. Okay, um, then we're gonna move from there. So let's make a graph here. Uh, uh, yes, because of our logical constraints, we'll always be in the upper right quadrant. Okay, so let's make um, E, be here and and C be here. That's completely arbitrary. I could have put them in in a different order. Okay. Um, so let's see. Um, let's do this in. Um, what's what's the maximum we would do? Fifty thousand divided by forty would be. Um, Let's do this in uh, 200s. Uh, 200, 400, 6, 8, 1,000, 1,200, 1,400, 2, 4, 6, 8, 12. Let's hope that's right. All right. So the next thing I like to do uh, as I mentioned last week, is I like to co color coordinate these. Okay, so I uh, normally bring my colored markers here. Maybe I might find some. <laughs> Are there some in the back? Uh, Bryson, Bryson, Bryson. Yeah, how would you fetch some colored markers? That doesn't look like. I'll bring them next time. Okay. So. So I'm just going to mark these with different lines. I'll do this with, um, I'll do squares here and triangles, okay? Okay? Normally I will use colored markers and I, I think you guys would really win from doing um, colored pencils, colored pens, uh, uh, even crayons whatever works. All right? So let's do that first one. How do we, on, uh, on that line, uh, that first constraint, 25C is less than 25,000. Okay, what's that, what kind of line is that going to be? Horizontal, right? Because the C is on our x-axis. So where's it going to be at? So if we, if we divide 25C is less than or equal to 25,000, we divide both sides by 25, right? We're going to say C is less than 1,000. So if we have a horizontal line, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, right here, uh, there we go. We've got that line right there. And if you don't do this, you probably are going to want to annotate this line. So it's clear to you what this constraint means. You don't have to look back. Because I have a dotted line there, to me, it's been annotated. But if you use one color, you definitely are going to want to make sure when you do your graphs, you know what each line on your graph, which constraint that reflects. How about the next one? 25C plus 40E is less than 50,000. Okay, is that a horizontal line anymore? No. Is it a vertical line? No. Okay, so we need to draw this line. What, what we say last week was the quickest way to figure out where this line is going to be. Yes, yeah, so if we, if we 
All we need are two points, right? So let's find the two intercepts, the x-intercept and the y-intercept, or in this case, the c-intercept and the e-intercept, and, and go from there. So if, if c is 0, okay, so if c is 0, um, sorry, if c is 0 right here, what is e going to be? We get uh, 50,000 divided by 40, which is, is it exactly 1,200? Six, eight, eight, okay, so it's going to be about, I don't know, right here. Right there. And what if E is zero? It's going to be somewhere along here, right? So now you do 50,000 divided by 20, and you get 2,000. Uh, two, four, six, eight, right here. Right? So now we've got two points, that's all we need for our line. Okay? Let's do our third one. 40E is greater than or equal to 15,000. What kind of line is that? It's vertical where? <laughs> What, what is 15,000 divided by 40? 375. 375? Okay, so let's put that right here about, okay? All right. The one thing I've forgotten to do is I've forgotten to indicate on which direction So let's go back. Should we be above or below this line? So we need to be below that line. I always put in these so it helps me know where I'm going to be. The dotted line, are we above or below that line? We're below it, right? How about the squared line? We're above it. <coughs> And then our last line, 25C is greater than or equal to 10,000. We have another horizontal line at 400. Uh, triangles. <laughs> and are we above or below that line? Okay. So then it says, graph a feasible region. Where's the feasible region in here? Yeah, it's right here. Right there, that's the feasible region. Right there. Those are the only points that meet all of our constraints. Okay? <clears throat> Part C, determine the coordinates of each extreme point. Okay, let's just take this as an example right here. That extreme point is the intersection of the dotted line with the dashed line. So, <coughs> You would find where they intersect with each other, because we're running out of time, I won't do that. And then you could plug, so you would get some value for E and C. Okay? And then you could figure out what the profit is at that point, because now you know what E is, and C is at that point, and you say, if we did this point, what the profit would be. We could do some point in here. That's going to turn out to not be very helpful. Just a um, cool little tidbit. The solution is going to be at one of those four points. The solution is always at the intersection of our constraints. Okay. So when you do part D, you only have to compute these four points. 
So if we only have something like this, it's not too terrible. We can check four points. That's not. But when you start talking about many, many more variables and many more lines, that becomes less.